back to our red velvet. Um, we're going from one piece of red velvet cake and making us happy to five pieces, possibly making us the same amount of happy. This is where things get a little freaky. So this is active. This is the um, amount of activity in the nucleus accumbens. So this represents a lot of activity. This represents low activity. You feel a certain amount of pleasure in every day life. So as you go about your day, your reward center is active, and it needs to be active. In a normal rat, this is how active the reward center is. In, an act, in a rat experiencing withdrawal, this is how active meaning there's a depression in the reward system. A rat in withdrawal is not experiencing the same amount of contentness as a normal rat is. What does that translate into? Back to our red velvet cake. Originally, we're going from regular to happy using one piece of red velvet. Um, now, we're going from depressed to regular using many pieces. So we're no longer seeking to get high. That's no longer the goal. The goal is now normal. And a little bit of the drug isn't going to do it. It's going to take a lot. But that's not the only piece of the addiction puzzle. There's a, there's a whole other piece. Um, it's not that simple, is it? <coughs> He's saying no. <laughs> um, there's a whole other center in the brain, other than the nucleus accumbens. It's represented by that green area right there, and it's called the amygdala. Now, the amygdala is responsible for some of your stress and fear. Um, there's a hormone that's produced inside the amygdala called CRF. And when CRF is produced in the amygdala, you feel stress. You guys all know it. Who knows the feeling, and just raise your hand just a little bit, who knows the feeling like right before a test or quiz when you realize you're not prepared? Okay, I said raise your hand just a little bit. <laughs> Alright. That's anxiety. That's stress. You guys all know that feeling. Now imagine feeling that amplified and all the time. All the time. I'm not talking about for an hour. I'm not talking about for a day. I'm not talking about for a week. I'm not talking talking a long time. That feeling of anxiety all the time. Combine that with the fact that you're depressed, that it will take you and that you've learned that the way to get back up is with a drug, that you have to do a lot of that drug and your goal is not just getting to high, it's again just getting to normal. What you can see here is the idea of the stress. So these are addicted rats in black, and these are non-addicted rats here in white. Um, at this point, they've not been fed anything. Um, there's, they're not being given any treatment. So this is the level of drug use in an addicted rat. This is the level of drug use in a non-addicted rat. What they, were done, what they did here is they uh, feed the rat a stress blocker. So there's a hormone. CRF, it binds to a receptor, CRF1. And what they did was block CRF1. As they increased the amount of blocking of their stress receptor, what do you see in the trend of drug use? It's going down. So as they block the stress system, the animal is using less and less of the drug. Well, how does that translate? So, we're aiming for normal. We're not aiming for high. It's going to take a lot of our drug to do it. But I said that there was something that didn't make sense about addiction earlier. It's this drive to do horrible things, right? So, people will lose their children, they will risk their lives over and over and over again, put themselves in bad situations, hurt themselves. And I figured, if it were just chasing a high, 
you know, if I'm actually reaching for that happy face and you slap my hand, there's going to be some point, if you keep slapping it, that I'm going to stop trying to reach for it. Unless I'm not looking for a high. What if something's behind me that's horrible? What if there's a psychological hell that I'm trying to get away from? That feeling of anxiety. That presents a better picture. If there's something behind me that I'm trying desperately to get away from, it makes more sense the lengths that I would take to get to there. Who thinks that paints a, uh, a little bit of a freaky picture of addiction? That's only the beginning. There's so many more parts to it. Um, and I don't have time to go over those parts, but I'm going to show you two of the most interesting parts. So, who's ever done something, or, or thought about doing something, that you know would be a lot of fun, that you really, really shouldn't do? Something that might be really enjoyable, but would get you in a lot of trouble in the end. Thank you, Verdesca. <laughs> Verdesca has. Um, when you do that, there's something in your brain that says, hey, no. <laughs> right? It's like, oh, it would be fun if, no. <laughs> in addiction, or, well, that part of the brain is actually the prefrontal cortex. It's the thing that's developing in you right now. In addicts, in people experiencing addiction behavior, um, this disorder, the prefrontal cortex is starts to has a problem function. Nobody's sure if that's pre-existing the condition, but it certainly gets worse in addiction. So you go from having the bad idea and to having that part of your brain that says no, to just having the bad idea. Again, that's not the worst. The worst is something called incentive salience. You guys all have a native drive in you, a, a very, very primal urge. If I try to kill any one of you, you will try to stop me. If I try to deprive you of food, you will seek food. If I try to deprive you of water, you will seek water. In the depth of addiction, that order, that hierarchy of life over other things is changed. Somehow, drug-seeking behavior takes precedence over the drive for water, over the drive for food, and over the drive for survival. Who knows what happens to a rat that is given free access to a drug? It'll take the drug and not eat, or it'll be hydrated because it won't be And then what'll happen? It'll die. It'll die. A rat will continue to administer itself a drug, neglecting water, neglecting food, until it dies. Now, I know it's a really depressing thought. I know that this is a really depressing idea. But the fact that they're researching and finding mechanisms that are causing these things is actually a point of hope. By blocking stress systems, by realizing that people aren't going for highs but trying to get back to normal, therapies can be developed. And there are some out there right now. Suboxone is something, or actually, who's heard of naltrexone? Anybody? Okay. Um, well, there are therapies out there. Um, in my researching of this, I have done a lot of different types of research. I have met with many people in active addiction um, of all kinds, um, alcohol, heroin, cocaine, and marijuana. Um, and I have read a lot on the subject. So if you've ever wanted to ask a question about drugs and what they'll do to you, I can answer that now. I do have to say that what I'm talking about is the commonality between all the drugs. So alcohol, for example, will do more to your system. It'll do more than just what we've seen. But 
all the drugs, all the drugs of addiction will do this. Questions? No. The same was general because they all end up, through different, me different mechanisms, they all end up activating the reward center. Wait, so which other part of the brain that the drug activates leads to the reward center? Huh. Um, it's 8.03. I know you guys have to get to class. If you jump on the Project 80 Facebook page, um, Ask questions, guys, please.